Hello and welcome to Python and SQL, two great languages that go great together. Sounds like a slogan or a commercial, and I am drinking out of my Star Trek mug. I drink out of that a lot, actually, because it holds a lot of coffee, and I'm wearing my official Windows shirt, if you can see it. And my name is Brian Cafferkey. I do a lot of presentations. Hopefully, you've seen some of my other ones. If not, subscribe. You're going to love it. This topic is really near and dear to me because I'm a big SQL person and I love Python, so I'm bringing the two together. And content for this can be found on github.com slash bcafferkey slash shared. A lot of times people will post notes and say, where's this content? You'll always find it under github.com slash bcafferkey slash shared in a lot of different content out there. So you'll also find other video presentation content, etc. So that's the, the thing I wanted to point out there. Now, I work at Microsoft, and in the last few months, my focus has been on developing training materials, online training content, for the data scientist certification role, Azure Data Scientist, to be precise. However, I wanted to call your attention to, among my courses out there, are also a lot of material from other people. We all work as part of Worldwide Learning, and this is called a platform called Microsoft Learn. So you can always find it if you don't remember the link or catch it, you can just look for Microsoft Space Learn and you'll find this site. Explore it because there's a lot of different things on it. You'll notice that uh, to the lower left, you have this drop down, and you can select the role. So you can look for the Azure Data Scientist role certification, that role. It'll show you the content I've developed, plus a few extra things I didn't and I don't wanna take all the credit. A lot of people worked on this content, not just me, but I was kind of the, the sort of person responsible, I guess you'd say, for this content. Uh, there's also data, data engineering and AI engineer, and there's a whole bunch of content all around. I focus on the data side, but there's Azure fundamentals and all kinds of stuff. So take a look out there. It's becoming really sort of the go-to place for training on Microsoft services and products. The other thing I want to mention is that it's very gamified and fun, and it's broken into small enough chunks that you can do a lot of it during your lunch hour. So if you don't have a lot of time and you just want to learn, you can pop in during your lunch hour, get through and one of the modules or two and keep doing that. And after a while, you're going to attain a lot of knowledge. So the goals of this presentation, one is I will break it up into smaller chunks, kind of following after the learn paradigm. And uh, we're going to talk about pandas and SQL, why SQL and Python, and the easiest way to do SQL. That's going to hopefully go quickly. I will not talk in this module, but I will do it in a quick follow-up, more robust SQL and accessing SQL databases. And I'm going to be working my way through something called like SQLite and how that gives you easy access. And there's the most direct you can drop right in and use SQL without actually dealing with relational databases all the way to getting to commercial databases like Oracle and SQL Server. And then we'll be wrapping up. First of all, you will need Python to do this, obviously. And my favorite way to get Python is to just go and get the Anaconda distribution. Since I focus on data analytics and data science, the Anaconda distribution is the best one to get just because it gives you everything you need to have. So it's going to give you pandas, it's going to give you scikit-learn, which is a machine learning module. It gives you all kinds of great things. Good place to start if you can. If you don't have enough space in your drive, or maybe you're working with some sort of a smaller machine and you don't want to take that kind of space, you can go with Miniconda. And if you don't even want to go that far, maybe you're really not a data-focused person and you just want to have raw Python, or maybe you already have it, but you can get that from python.org. No matter what you do, Python is considered a batteries included. That's sort of their philosophy, which means they give you a lot of the built-in libraries, or they give you a lot of libraries with it that do a lot for you, so you don't always have to keep going back and saying, oh, I need to read a file. Let me go get a module for that. Oh, I need to do this. It's, a lot of it will be included no matter which version you take. Anaconda just gives you everything, even... Jupyter Notebooks, which we'll be using today. Sometimes people ask me too, what's a good IDE to use to develop in Python? Jupyter Notebooks is one. If you're really looking to do something like web apps or something that's not data analytics, let me try that again, data analytics focused, uh, it you can use Spider. And again, the Anaconda distribution automatically gives you SPYDER, the Spider development platform and that's a really good ID. It's one of my favorites to use. It's fairly lightweight and it's powerful. All right. So what is pandas? Now of course I really like Kung Fu Panda. It's in some of my different things. I'm not sure why. It's a lighthearted movie series and uh, has a little Buddhist philosophy there. So I like that. So I'm using it as a theme here. So pandas is an open source Python package or library. 
It's rich in features focused on data manipulation. I cannot speak today. Data manipulation. And if you've ever used R data frames, it's really based on that idea. So it emulates R data frames. A lot of extra features in there as well. You can read and write data actually in many different formats. So if you're using Excel, using CSV files, flat files, whatever it is, including SQL Server databases, you'll be able to sort of leverage it. When you're using SQL Server databases, as we'll see, there's a few extra things you need to do, but you can do it. It's very fast and memory efficient, and it is the standard library for data wrangling in Python. So if you take nothing else away and you're going to go, go for an interview and you need to know Python, you should know about Pandas. You should be able to talk intelligently about it. I don't really think it matters what you do with Python. If you don't know anything about Pandas, you're missing a crucial library, certainly anything in the data analytics space. And as I mentioned, built-in SQL support. Now, when you do things with Python, there's a whole thing called the PEP standards. Python has an entire philosophy around it. It's all about readability, maintainability, clean, et cetera, in your code. It's why there's no squiggly lines to begin and end blocks of code. So when you import things, one of the really key standards is there's standard ways of importing libraries. So pandas as pd, numpy as mp, matplotlib.pyplot as plt. That's fairly standard. If you're going to do any kind of data analysis, generally you're going to want to bring those three things in and just have them available when you're working. The um, Yeah, so that's pretty standard. The other thing, the pd, mp, those are prefixes. So you're giving it sort of a short name prefix you can use when you're referencing the functions within the library. So why SQL? Well, first of all, if you already know SQL, and I tend to be around a lot of people, I come from a database engineering background, data development, business intelligence. So everybody around me generally knows SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language. So if you already know that, then you can jump into Python and you can already be very productive instantly because you can do everything you like and know and love about SQL within Python. So that's my first reason for doing this. SQL also just makes sense. When you're processing language, when you're trying to query, join, merge data, etc., SQL was designed to do that. It's a very well thought out system of, or API really, it's a language just designed to do that, developed by EFCOD for, from IBM way back. So it goes back decades. It's very well thought out, and it's the core language of all database management systems today, the, the relational database management systems. So there's a whole standard. It has an open standard, ANSI SQL, et cetera. So it makes sense. It was designed to do exactly what you're trying to do, which is query and data wrangle. It will scale and perform well when you're using it with a back-end database system that already can scale well. And the interesting thing is that Spark has built-in SQL support for those reasons. If you talk to the people who wrote Spark, people who are working on this, they said they brought in SQL because then they could actually tune it and make it perform better. The other thing is, why not? If you're so, the easiest way to start in is to use SQLDF, SQLDF, which is a library which is part of Pandas or Pandas SQL. And behind the scenes, it's using SQLite, so you don't have to think about it, but it is what's happening behind the scenes. And you can treat Pandas data frames as if they were tables. So, this is really nice because Pandas is the library you're going to want to use for data wrangling, etc. It's got a lot of functionality. But when you want to use SQL, you can just take data frames, not SQL tables, and treat them just like they were SQL tables, as we'll see. It's great for small workloads. It's not designed to be like terabytes of data, but if you're just working with relatively small tables, you're doing some analysis, it's really well suited to that. The SQL is somewhat limited in this. Uh, there's no right outer join type logic, but if you're doing inner joins or even left joins, it's okay. And again, it jump starts our data wrangling abilities. So I call it pi SQL DF. It really should just be SQL DF. We'll see in a minute, but we are going to create a function in there for SQL DF. Okay. So we are now in a Jupyter Notebook, and this is, again, as I mentioned, the first approach of how we can use SQL right away with Python. And, uh, you know, we've got some things here, some notes here, some links you can use to get uh, more documentation. But again, you want all of the data to fit in memory, and that's because you're using data frames. Data frames are in-memory tables, so if you're used to SQL and things, you query tables. Typically, you're querying things, but the table is physically on some sort of disk storage. This case, think of it more like a spreadsheet. You're bringing it in, and you're going to work with it. In fact, Pandas stands for Panel Data, as the author of the package originally explains, and it is that kind of concept, almost like a spreadsheet. So you don't have to worry about having any kind of SQL database. 
Uh, we'll explain that. But here we are. We're going to import pandas, as we saw before in my slide, PD. Then we're going to take something, another library, pandas SQL, and we bring bring in SQLDF. And then we'll bring in pandas SQL again. We're going to bring this in for a specific data set we want. So we're just going to bring in load births. I could have just done a comma here. Not sure why I did it. It's two separate statements. Probably copied it from somewhere up here. Anyway, uh, we're going to bring in this data set. So sometimes what happens is you can load data from within packages. Another thing I think Python copied from R. R brings, gives you a lot of data sets you can play with. And so we're going to do that here just to demonstrate what we're trying to do. So we're going to create a data frame, births, And we're just going to say load births from here. And then we can run this SQL statement. And let me clear this out because I see my cells are still populated from my last experiment. So you can see this is going to happen. I'm going to run this cell. You can run a cell by just saying control enter and that won't advance the cell. If you do shift enter, it will advance. And if you're not familiar with this, I am working in a Jupyter notebook. I don't want to go into how Jupyter works and things. I could be just as easily doing this from PyCharm or Spider or something. But I like Jupyter notebooks for and analytics because it gives you direct output. You can jump back to cells you previously executed. So it's great for demoing. You can get Jupyter Notebook. It comes with the Anaconda distribution. I have videos on it. So go check that out if you're not sure how to use Jupyter Notebooks. But you can see here, I just did a very simple SQL statement. Uh, ended with a semicolon. And I just use this function SQLDF, which I imported here. So that's how easy it is. I can get right up and running with data frames using SQL. And you can see it lists things here. And you notice it also gives us our the index. Data frames like R, uh, data frames and pandas have this idea of an index, which if you don't ask for one, it just gives you a default sequential number. OK, so let's look at a little more advanced approach here. We're going to create a query and store it in a variable. It's a multi-line query. So in Python, what we can do to do that is either start it with three single quotes or three double quotes. Strings in Python can use either double quotes or single quotes to demarcate them. Uh, and then you end it the same way. And so we get a sentence here, a SQL statement. We're going to select date, sum of births from births, grouping by date. Now, unfortunately, the date column is a little, very redundant here because we have a date column. But we're also going to be using the ANSI standard date function, which what it's going to do is just extract the date and get rid of this extra time stamp that isn't really used anyway. So it looks a little cleaner. Then we're going to rename the column in the display so that it gives us a better name like DOB, like date of birth. And we'll rename births as total births so we know what we're looking at. So let's try running this and we'll get a better idea what happens there. So you can see here we got a nicer looking date. The column headings were replaced as we asked. And you can do a lot of things in there. So you can do rounding. You can do a lot of functions in here. And we'll see. We can do joins. I'm going to do very basic SQL, but you can do more advanced uh, SQL. Uh, all kinds of joins. This one is, as I mentioned, not going to support uh, right outer joins, but you can do other things with it. Now, we'll notice this locals thing. This is going to come back. I'll explain that in a minute. But it has to do with when you're setting configuration variables for the SQLDF. You can use either local environment variables or global environment variables. Now, I'm not going to get into it. Within the Jupyter Notebooks, it doesn't seem to make any difference. In fact, you don't even have to pass it. But I'll uh, demonstrate something with this, which is a more generally usable thing. Uh, I can, as you notice, either way I run it, it does the same thing, right? So let's take a look here. One minute. <clears throat> One of the useful things in Python is the ability to create functions. What I want to do is I'm going to create a function, which instead of SQLDF, I'll call it PySQLDF. And you know, it's got a nice little comment here. All it's going to do is return the function SQLDF but it's going to pass in your query and it's going to hard code globals. The general idea I want to get across here is by using a function within this notebook, I can use this and call it. Not only do I avoid having to keep saying locals or globals, but I can centralize that code so that if later on someone says, you know what, that actually has changed and you need to change that to locals, I could then just change the function and everywhere that's calling it is fixed. So that's a really good idea. That's why people like reusability. Otherwise, I might have thousands of places where I'm hard-coded this, and I have to go search it down and fix it. OK, so I'm going to make sure I run this, define the function. And now I'll run it. And notice this time I'm not passing anything. It's just PySQLDF. And so it does the same thing, because 
the query is still there. I saved it as a variable. It's still available. And so it's going to run that function, and it takes care of it. So the nice thing to do when you're doing Python is leverage functions, leverage objects if you want to do object classes, etc. But definitely functions are really handy in analytics and work, etc. Now what I want to do here is show you how to use built-in, you know, load the burst table there. Not terribly useful by itself. You're probably going to want to do something like what I do a lot of is reading CSV or flat files or something and then do, anal yeah, do analysis on them. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, PWD will show you where we currently are working. A lot of times you'll see this with an exclamation PWD. You have to do it this way. Let me try it that way. Uh, percent. Yeah, sorry. So you can do the magic command percent PWD. It in Jupyter Notebooks it defaults to work, use that without having to do the magic, but it's kind of handy. But you're getting um, your current working directory, which is nice. So again, I'm not. Uh, don't have to keep including this import, but I'm doing it for clarity using pandas. What I'm going to do now is I've got a subfolder from where I'm located under this notebook called data. So using the period forward slash data gets me to that subfolder. And now what I'm able to do is just reference that and load in this file I have, which is a CSV file, dim customer CSV. And I'm going to put that into this variable DF customer. Now it doesn't do anything because that's now an in-memory table, a data frame holding some data. I can test that by using this function or method that hangs off of that called head. And by putting three in there, I can limit it to just three rows. The default is five, but I don't want to display that much. And it gives me a pretty nice looking display that shows me what's in that table. So that's pretty, pretty cool so far. We haven't done anything with it in SQL yet, but we will in a minute. Now, one of the things that happens, let me jump down here for a minute. I'm going to display that and you'll notice something. Let me jump down here. When we display it, we see this index. So just one thing I was experimenting with, can I get rid of that index using SQL? Well, you can in pandas by using this set index. What you're really doing is the index is sort of like a primary key when you're referencing a data frame. So you can say, I'd actually rather use the customer key. This is an arbitrary number that is just created as part of the data frame, not terribly useful. I could set it to other columns. I'm gonna do the customer key. And let's watch what happens if I do. Um, just run this and you notice that that index number to the left goes away. Now you might wonder, as I did, can I do that with SQL? Will that help me? Um, oops. And the answer is no, it still keeps it there. Not sure why it does that. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, yeah. So we will see ways to get rid of it later, but in this basic SQL stuff you won't, but you could always take the results of your SQL, SQL query, put it into another data frame, and then take that off or display it another way. All right, so here we're gonna bring in now another data frame we're gonna create. We're gonna read in internet sales. This, by the way, comes from AdventureWorks, which is Microsoft's database that they use for training, etc. It has no real data, but it looks a lot like real data, and it's good for training. And one of the things I wanna show you also is, a lot of times when you're querying in SQL, you need to know what the data types are. You may want to do averages or sums, and it's not going to help you if the data type is actually saved as a string or some other incompatible type. So I always like to see what the type is. Now, if I were using a real database, I'd probably go into something like SQL Server Management Studio and just look at the folders and looked at the column definitions or do a describe command, et cetera, and it would show me. But since I'm using data frames, an easier way I can do that is simply just use the dtypes method off the data frame and it tells me these are you know, 64 bit integers. Some of these things are actually stored as objects, floats, et cetera. And objects in this case probably is a string in most cases, in this case, probably a date. Python is very fond of objects. Okay, so here we're gonna import again, SQL DF, and just to kind of show you a little bit more going on, SQL statement, we're selecting specific columns this time, not asterisks. Again, we're limiting things, the limit five. Notice the SQL is ANSI standard SQL, so limit. If, used to, if you're like I am and I'm used to SQL Server, I would normally say top, top five, top whatever. Uh, but in this case, I have to use the ANSI standard. And I'm giving it the column names and I can say as, and I can, if I need to put a space in the column name title, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna put quotes around it. And since this, I'm using the doc string format, which is the three quote characters, the beginning and end, 
which means I can enter any number of lines. It will cross lines. It's not a problem. So I've got this whole thing, and I can just run this. And it just gives you, you know, nice little display here. And finally, I can do something here where I'm joining customer. I'm doing a left outer join to internet sales. And I'm using, and notice you can do these table aliases so that I can make it easier to do my joins. I don't have to use full table names. And c.customerkey to s.customerkey. And I'm just limiting this again for display purposes. Okay. And you get the idea. So it shows you that there. So you can do, I mean, this could have many rows. This could be very complicated. I'm keeping it simple. But you have the full SQL language here. So you could join 10 tables. You can... Um, do all kinds of you know sums and counts. You can sort, you can group, you can filter, all that good stuff. Where clauses are good. So you get all this stuff here. So have fun with it. That is the most, ex basically the most accessible way I can think of in Python to be able to use SQL right away. Behind the scenes, as I mentioned, SQLite is automatically installed as part of your installation of Python. So SQLite's actually behind the scenes kicking in. And what it's really doing is it's loading this into SQLite and SQLite's handling this heavy lifting and doing the SQL support. Because of that, be aware there's some overhead involved. So if you said I have, you know, five terabytes of data, this would probably be a really bad performing way to do it. And I wouldn't recommend doing that anyway because you're gonna have problems because data frames have to fit in memory. So this is really not true SQL in the sense you're not using uh, real relational databases. You're really using this as a way to use the SQL language with data frames and it's using a client-side database tool called SQLite, Database Management System for client-side tools. Again, not robust enough to handle heavy loads. Very useful, though, for just kind of your typical analysis. Probably what you would normally do in something like Excel will work fine using this method. All right, so I'm going to break off here. There's not a lot to do other than to wrap up and, and close this off, and I'm going to pick up again another video where I'm going to get into another way of doing this. It's a little more in-depth, gives us more flexibility, and I think some more features. But I wanted to show you this first because this is the quickest, easiest way to get in, and I'm all about ease. So if this works and does what you need, you're good to go. Stop there. I don't believe in doing more than you need. I'm big on parsimony. So that's it. Thank you. Please subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.